our message and the prophets. And today I want to invite you to a conversation with God. Let me ask you, how many of you this morning, think about it, quiet your mind, quiet your spirit. How many of you truly would like to have a conversation with God today? Okay, praise the Lord. That is expected. When you talk to someone, your friends, many times your friends, they are not telling you everything. They are not always being completely truthful. And many times friends would say something to make you feel good. Is that right? Yes. Isn't that what friends are for? Just make you feel good? Yes. So many of us, when we go to church, we expect that it will make us feel good. And yes, it, it does make us feel good. It should make us feel good. But if you go and see a doctor and you have a conversation with a doctor and you want the doctor make you feel good, huh? like uh, you have no problem with your cholesterol, your blood pressure is fine, uh, you will live to be 100 years old, uh, n don't worry, you continue your life just like it is. Is that what you want to hear your doctor? No. No. You want, do you want a doctor to tell you the truth? Yes. So if he tells you you need to change your diet so that your blood pressure will go down, is it a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing. So this morning, I want to invite you to a conversation with God. But at the same time, that it would be a truthful conversation where we will allow God to tell you something about ourselves that might be a bit like the doctor telling us something that maybe we need to change, improve, uh, correct. Because the scriptures are given to us, isn't it? And, and the New Testament, it says, for our instructions, for our discipline, for our corrections, sometimes to rebuke something and change us, but always for one purpose, your edification, your salvation, uh, your, your standing with God, so that you walk with the Lord correctly. Amen? Amen. So let's step in the message this morning. And the message of Malachi centers around uh, a series of questions. It's like uh, questions that God asks, and the people ask, and God answers, and sometimes return with another question. So the book of Malachi is the last book of the New Testament, and it is the most conversational book of the Bible. It's really a conversation, a repeated question and answer. So let's look at this next slide and look at some of the questions that would be raised this morning as we will move on into the message. And which way have you loved us? And what way have we despised your name? And what way have we defiled you? And what way have we worried him? And what way shall we return? And what way have we robbed you? And what way have we spoken against you? Oh, wow. This already tells us a lot about. It looks like it's going to be a conversation that will go deeper and tell us things that it seems that all of these questions reveal one thing, that the people don't seem to be aware of the answer that God is going to tell us. God said something to them and says, how? How, how is it possible? What did we do? Uh, wh wh where is it coming from? We, we're not aware of that. So let's, let's plunge into the text of, of each one and see the background and see what we can learn from this conversation with God. Malachi 1, 1 and 3. God says, I have always loved you. Can you say that this morning? I have always loved you. This word is not only addressed to them, but it is addressed to you. And it is essential to all of us this morning. This is the first thing in this book that God wants you and I to learn. So it is important. That's the first thing that comes out of the mouth of God. He wants you to get that. And you know you will see in this message this morning that because the doubt they don't believe it. They don't trust it fully. They don't have this assurance that it will lead them into a lot of other uh, maybe negative attitudes. We will see that this morning. The first thing that God declares, he wants you to know that. The first question they raise, in what way have you loved us? They really don't know. 
God led them back into the land. The temple has been rebuilt. The sacrifices are done there. God wants to bless his nation that he has chosen in Abraham. Christ is going to come from this nation. But they are totally unaware. They don't grasp the, 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 that truth. Your relationship with God this morning should be based on the assurance that God loves you. If you don't have that, you are missing the point of coming to church. You are missing the point of the sermons. You are missing the points of serving God. You, you don't get it. It's not religion. It's not dutiful uh, rituals. It is starting with what God initiated. I have loved you. This must be set in your heart this morning. Say amen. amen. Do you know this morning that God loves you? Are you sure of it? The first sin that is named in this text of Malachi is that they doubt the love of God. That's the first sin. The first problems and that's relationship. And we will see that it leads first to, all, to spiritual carelessness. This is what we are going to talk. If we would want to have another title to name, I, I, I called it conversation with God, but it could have been spiritual carelessness. It could be that because this is w where we're going this morning. It starts with doubting, not being sure of God's love, and it produces other attitudes in our lives as we will see this morning and it leads to all other sinful attitudes that are listed in this book let's go to the next scriptures verse 7 and 8 but i will give you verse 6 it's not on the slide but god is saying to them if i am a father where is my honor if i am a master where is my respect how have you despised how have we despised your name? That's from verse 6. Let's continue. By presenting defiled food on my altar. That's the answer of God. They are asking, how have we despised your name? How have we, you know, missed miss this? By presenting defiled food on my altar. And you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying the table of the Lord is contempt contemptible. When you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? And when you sacrifice crippled and diseased animals, is that not wrong? What does that indicate to us today? First, it starts with a lack of trust in the love of God, and it produces a lack of respect in the way of going about their life and their service of to God. They should have been good models to lead the nations, but they have lowered their standards, and the nations have lowered their standards. This was very clear. This was very clear in Leviticus. This was very clear. All the priesthood, the rules and the regulations of how to approach God, how to sacrifice to God, never crippled, never diseased, never weak, never blind, never something. It had to be perfect. It had to have a value. It had to come from the best. The best of the best. This is what God is not going to accept anything but the best. And we should never dare to even approach God in this way that, you know, just the casual, just the whatever, it doesn't really matter. We should never approach the God like that. This is not how God depicts himself. This is not how God wants to be treated. And God expresses it here. This is what you have done to me. Uh, how, what have we done wrong? You know, and they are not aware of that. It's so easy for us to say, oh, how awful is it that these people have done it? But, but do we sometimes commit similar actions? Yes? Oh, I'm glad that you know that already. When we, yeah, so I don't need to convince you or something, so that you, when you and I, we give our second best, like, it's just something. Have you ever done that? I, just, just don't raise your hands. There's a birthday of someone, a special occasion, and then you, you want to give a gift, but you don't really want to sacrifice much. So you take something you don't really like, or don't really want in your house, and, just, and you just pack it, make it look nice, and say, oh, this is, this is for you. Yeah. So we do this kind of thing sometimes, but we do it. And this is not only about money. We're not talking about money here this morning. We're talking about time, energy, life, living for God. Here is a warning for all of us. When 
you and I begin recognizing that this is in my life, when we start to recognize that, we should beware because this is the indication that it is the beginning of the decline. Worse things going to be committed by you, as we will be more convinced as we move in the message. You start with this, and be sure when you recognize it, whoa, stop. Come back to the Lord immediately. Don't go on, because you are on the decline. And uh, later on, I, I don't put it here, but in verse 8, he says, offer that to your governor. Would, would that be pleasing to him? And the message, the Bible, the best message is, try a trick like that with your banker or your senator. How far do you think it will get you if, if, you, if you want to do something like that to your senator or your governor or something? Amen? So you, you, it would not be acceptable. It would not be acceptable. So this morning, this, God is having a conversation with us and he wants you and, and I to understand a bit deeper. You know, like we're not like a friend just trying to please others. God is talking the truth into our life, asking us to think more deeply about the kind of relationship that we have with him. And verse 10, he even goes as far as saying, please someone, shut the door of the temple. I don't even want to hear any more of this. I don't want to have any more this kind of sacrifice. I, I don't want to have a temple and a church and have this kind of attitude there. Please shut the door. I, I'm not interested in anything. I'm not taking pleasure in these things. So that's quite serious what God is saying. So it is addressed to all of us in how we are progressing in our life with the Lord. If you continue in verse 12, I think we will click the next one. You are profaning my name by saying at, that the table of the Lord is defiled and that its fruit and its food is contemptible. And you say, what a burden, and sniff contemptuously at it, says the Lord of the heavenly armies. When you present maimed, crippled, and diseased animal, and when you bring the offering, should I accept it from your hand as the Lord? You see that spiritual indifference always gets worse. It always will go first. Now, it started with a lack of love. Now we are in a lack of respect. But look at these people. They are doing the motions. They are doing the, everything. People come to the temple every day. They are there. They are in duty. People are coming to the, to the temple. They are washing. They are making the sacrifices. They are doing the actions. But God says, your actions are unacceptable to, to us uh, today. That's what the Lord is saying. They went through the motions. They do the liturgy. And then God says, you say, or their attitude is toward God, what a burden. I'm giving you some Bible versions. What a burden. How boring. It's too hard to serve the Lord. And you turn up your noses at my commands. And what God is using for a word like, like, like the burden, what a burden is too hard, it's like wearisome, it's troublesome, it's hard. That, that's the word that God is using in that. Do you feel like that sometimes? That serving God, being a Christian, living the Christian life is, is hard. It's, it's, it, or it's too hard. But here this, of course, there, is, there are times it is hard. We're not denying that. But when the attitude is, it's too hard, like it's not worth it. I've done enough. I've done my share. It's not worth this. It's too wearisome. Serving God, uh, volunteering, uh, helping, getting engaged, it's, it's wearisome. It's, 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 it's not worth it. That's, that's what we, we read here. You know, some people, when they think about serving God, they, or living the Christian life, it thinks that they should make their life more comfortable. And sometimes it does because we have the blessing of God in our lives. But it is not necessarily so. Serving God may mean poverty. Serving God may mean adversities. Serving God may mean suffering for certain people. If you go to different countries, different place, different land, it is you know, because, because here we have it easy doesn't mean that it should be easy for everybody else. 
the gospel, the, uh, what we call the gospel of prosperity, is not the, prosper the gospel that applies to all the nations of the world. The message of Jesus should be applicable to all. So even though today we say, okay, pastor, it's fine, I, we understand that, but I'm not a priest. I, I'm, I'm only a Christian going to church. I'm just a regular guy or lady. But don't you read in Romans chapter 12 that we are exhorted, urged, we are urged, admonished. It's more than just uh, invited to. It's like we are commanded to offer to God living sacrifices. You and I. So we are included in this text. And we need to check our attitude, how we approach God. Because you and I, we are told, if you claim to be a Christian, your life should be a living life, a living life for God, a living sacrifice, acceptable, it says in Romans, acceptable to God. So is your life fully acceptable to God? We like to think so. We want to say, yes, yes, my life is here. What's wrong with me? I'm, 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 a, I'm a good guy. I'm an good, average Christian. So it's, it's fine with me. No, it's not like that. We are having a conversation with God, and God is speaking into our life. And he's saying, hey, wait, wait a minute. Go a little bit deeper. I have something I see. I see in your life. I pay attention to you. So what kind of life uh, do you have? You know, it is very easy. This is the easiest and the most natural thing in the world to just... Uh, move into carelessness, taking it casual. This is a mark of the modern church. This is a mark of mo modernity. Uh, if you're modern, it, it, everything needs to be cool. Everything needs to be casual. We should walk away from all traditions and just do things like, like we want to do. We are free, free expressions. And many times it, it brings into our life a lack of fear of the Lord, of respect, a deep respect for the things of God. We walk in here and we don't know we have walked in here. This is not the church. This is just a meeting point. It's the, 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 the awareness of the holy presence of God is not there. The way that we show through our life sometimes. So that God, God is reminding us of these things. The Bible says in, in Peter that you and I, we are all priests. Oh, no, no, no more excuses. So if you say, I'm not a priest, I'm not in the Old Testament. We all have been called out of darkness. And we have been set up by God and called a holy nation and the nations of priests. We are priests before the Lord. We have this priesthood by the Holy Spirit in us. We have been sanctified, we have been set apart, and we are called to live with the standards. You know, there were standards for a priestly life in the Old Testament. But if we are all priests in the New Testament, we, it must be telling us something about the standards we should have in our life. If you agree with me, say hi. And if you don't agree, say hi, so Yeah, because it's true. Amen. God desires worship that comes from love. So if it's not love, it's not about duty, it's not about ceremonies. Let's continue a conversation with God. Chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. This is another thing you do. Oh, so our conversation continues. You flood the altar of the Lord with tears complaining, whining, weeping, wailing, because he no longer pays attention to your offering and takes no pleasure in it from your hand. Yet, you ask, for what reason? Because the Lord acts as a witness between you and the wife of your youth, because you were unfaithful to her, your partner, the wife of your covenant. First rules here. To be careless about spiritual things at the beginning, will not only affect your relationship with God, but it will affect your relationship with every people. That's what we see here. It starts with God. God's not happy with the service. The heart is not there. We do the motions, but the, God is not uh, pleased with this. But now God says, you have another thing that you do. You complain. You want the blessing. You want more blessing. You want more prosperity. You want more blessing. You, you want everything your way. And you complain you're not happy. Why, why, why? And then God says, you ask for what reason? Because. God is speaking the truth. You, you ask a question, God gives you an answer. Because the Lord acts. They were wondering why God refused to accept their offerings. You cannot separate your dealing with God 
from the rest of your life. Okay, on Sunday, it's a certain way the rest of your life. As soon as you start to move into carelessness, spiritual carelessness and difference, there will automatically be other results, uh, fruits, and other areas of your life. And your work, and the quality of your work, and your relationship, the way you speak, the way you dress, the way you conduct yourself with your children, the way you conduct yourself with your spouse, there will be a direct uh, relationship between your spiritual carelessness. It will reflect upon every other. That's what God is saying here in this text. You see why? Because, look, now, we're talking about marriage now. They ignored the wedding vows that they had made before God. Let's move to the next slide. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit you are his. And what does he want? God wants godly children. He wants your family. He wants your, your impact of your children to, to continue to... Uh, He wants the impact of your life and, and marriage to reflect upon your children. How, think for a moment, how are affect, how the children are affected in a broken marriage? God says that in every divorce, there is cruelty, elements of violence. You know, as soon as one says to the other, I don't want to be married with you. There's violence, there's hurt, there's a broken heart. I, I, I used to love you, I promised that I would cherish and love you for the rest of my life, but now I don't love you anymore, I won't, you know. And we're talking about the woman of my youth. I met you when you were young and beautiful, now you have changed. <laughs> so now I'm turning my eyes onto a younger and more beautiful one. So this is violent. This is very hurtful and destructive. And vice versa, ladies, don't laugh too much. Because in today's generation, women are the one initiating divorce, much more than men. In these old days, it was men. But in our generation, women are the one walking out the door and telling their husband, I don't love you, I want another one. I found him at the office. It's much better than you. So, so God sees divorce like and another tra translation it says like covering one's clothing with violence it's an expression of injustice of, of gross injustice done to someone I keep the house you take the dog and the car you know <laughs> and I, like uh, you know we, we hurt each other there's, there's a lot of violence and, and all of this and it leaves its mark the, the covering of violence is, is a mark of it leaves a mark it, it's destructive. It will follow you. You know, many people, they, they choose divorce because they want to get out of a situation, to finish with something, but it's never finished. Divorce does not finish something. It just leads you into another type of level of situation. Sometimes it's even more complex, especially if you have children. You're never out of it. Twice in verse 15 and 16, it says, guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth. And guard here, the term is very important for all of us men and women. It means edge. Set your boundaries. You must have boundaries. If you are not married and you are courting and you are planning to have boyfriend, girlfriend, you better set your boundaries. There are lines you are not going to cross. I'm not going to become pregnant because we are married before we are married. I'm not going to allow this. I know some Christians uh, that have set their boundaries, uh, no kissing before marriage, uh, uh, sometimes some of them when uh, as far as no holding hands or some whatever or whatever they choose to do or we are not going to be together in the same apartment at midnight 
by ourselves watching a movie. We are not going to uh, step into this kind of situation. And then marriage is the same thing. You know, you can be married to a beautiful wife, but there are also other beautiful women around, or vice versa. There are nice looking and handsome men that are, you know, uh, around also. We're not blind people. We have eyes. God gave us eyes. So we need to set boundaries. Jesus taught us that adultery or unfaithfulness starts in the heart. It's, this is where it starts. Lusting, thinking about, continuing. So the Bible says, set an edge, your boundaries. You must, you must. Otherwise, you will slip into a dangerous slope. It's very dangerous. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth means have the same commitment to your spouse as the Lord Jesus has toward you. Is he faithful to you regardless of your good and bad? Yes, so be faithful to each other. The marriage, who says that marriage? Oh, don't dream about marriage being so easy. Marriage is not easy. Tell us the truth. It's hard to be married because it has a lot of wills and conflicts and decision makings and pressures and, and all sorts of problems that are multiplied with the number of people in the house. The more children and the more complicated and costly and expensive it is. So it is hard, especially at the beginning when if, if you have young children, two or three children, this is almost impossible to, to go through these years and staying sane in your mind. You really need the grace of God. You know older couple, years down the road, when you look back to these early years, you wonder how did I go through these things and we are still together and, and, and still in love or something? Because these were definitely tough times. I don't know if you, some of you older folks agree with me this morning, but uh, this, is, this is not easy. But God says, remain loyal. It's very dangerous. Proverbs 6 says, do not lust after her beauty in your heart. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty. Oh, wow. Yes, this is very dangerous. It is very dangerous. It's the, even the Bible says it's so powerful, it's like fire. And then the proverb says, who is going to take fires, put it in his bosoms without uh, getting burned. You, you take coals from the, the, the fire and you put it on your bosom, are you not going to burn yourself? Are you going to succeed to do that? So God hates divorce. God hates divorce. Of course, let me say that. There are provision for divorce. Jesus said it. We're not encouraging divorce. But here in this text, they were divorcing for the wrong reason. They just wanted to have a nicer, more beautiful, or maybe even a foreign wife, a slave or something, some other women. This, this is, God hates this kind of violence. But when people are stuck in a marriage where there is physical, verbal abuse, the children are being beaten, and the, there's uh, negligence, uh, financial negligence and thing, God is not, you know, uh, against in, in that sense. There are, it's never the best option. It's not the ideal of God. God says you become one. That's the standard of God. But because of the hardness of our heart, because of the evil and relationship, and because of the abuse, there are some provisions to protect someone who is a victim without feeling guilty for the rest of your life. I believe that's my, my, my opinion. Even though it's never to be uh, the, the options looked at easily. It leads to another rebuke. Malachi chapter 2 verse 17. You have worried the Lord with your words. You ask, how have we worried you? By your saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. And where is the God of justice? They have made the Lord worried by their words. Wow. That's powerful. The words are powerful. And here they are questioning the justice of God, the fairness of God. L look at us. We are here serving God. I've been a Christian for so many years, X, X years. And look, I've um, not been prospered. And look at my neighbors, got this big car and all the thing, and he is a corrupt politician. And 
you know, they, 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 they have the easy way and uh, sinful people, they, they backslide, they are against God and they, they make more money and we suffer. Where is, God's not fair. God's not fair. This is not fair. We are his children. Where is the justice of God? And this is, this is what they are, they are saying. And, and many times when we question, you see, you see a direct connection here. The first thing, they did not trust the love of God. Why should they trust the justice of God and the fairness of God? When the time gets tough, when you, you are in a situation that you did not expect, you were expecting the easy, comfortable prosperity that sometimes Christians can enjoy, but you are not, you are in the troubled time. So if you are not convinced of the love of God, the total love of God, you will practice exactly the same thing here. If you are not convinced that God loves you, when the tough time will come, God, you abandoned me, it's not fair, why, 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 why? Okay, let's move to the next, Malachi chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. I'm going to read the, the, a little bit ahead of you. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them from the time of your ancestors, from, a, from the very beginning. Now, return to me, and I will return to you. This is the message of every page of the Bible almost. Return to me, I love you, I want you, I want to bless you, I have a plan for you, I know the plans for your future. I don't want to give you any uh, hard times, I just want to bless you. From Deuteronomy onwards, that's the continual message of God. So when they move away from God, it's always return to me so that I can continue to bestow my love to you and my blessing to you. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away? <laughs> that's that's, that's a, a tragedy of human beings. The, the blindness of recognizing our own spiritual conditions. You and I are exactly the same. If this morning, Pastor Jennifer and I would open the service and sing, who this morning in Lighthouse, you are victorious in Christ and you are on top of everything. Yeah, hey, everybody would raise our hands. Is that right? Say yes. Yes, yes okay. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> because we don't, realize the inside what it is of like the the the, uh, the darkest things we need the holy spirit to conv to bring that conviction all of us are blind to our own spiritual uh, conditions they were not aware that they had left god they didn't see a need they, and that's a problem when we christian do not see our own spiritual need what, what can we ask the Lord? What can we ex, uh, expect from the Lord? We, we don't see the need. We don't see the need to repent. We don't see. How many of us, be honest this morning, you come to church Sunday after Sunday, you hear these messages from the pastors, and we always tell you we pray, we believe the message is from the Lord, and it is for edification, transformation, correction, and everything. You hear the message every week, and then zoom. Just zoom. Not even like this. Just zoom straight through. Or sometimes, worst, you say, oh, I'm so glad so and so is here this morning. He can hear that. That's for that person. You know, we, 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 we can recognize the spiritual condition of others. Is that true? That's what Jesus talked about, the, the straw in the beam. You can see the straw in someone else, but you cannot see the beam in your own eyes. This is the same message as what we are reading here. We are blind, and unless the Holy Spirit will help us to see that, we, we minimize sinfulness, we don't see all the, the wrong things in our life. Spiritual indifference robs us from that. Spiritual indifference robs God from our love to Him. Spiritual indifference robs God from our life honoring Him. Spiritual indifference robs God 
from our service and our worship to him that is acceptable to him. It does that, spiritual indifference. That's why it's so dangerous. And this text here, we see that then God says, you rob and cheat me. How? Why? Did we? No, we didn't. We did not do this. And now God is going to talk about the way we view money. And we are going to also understand the, fi the financial laws of, of the Lord. And here Jesus is not concerned with the size of your wallet. Is concerned with the size of your heart. You understand that, huh? Lar we have this idea that large gift is more important to God than small gifts. That's not true because we know the story of the widow with the two uh, uh, coins. And Jesus praised her more than the ones who gave generously, or maybe not generously, that's not a, a right term. They give more, but not necessarily generously, because generously is pleasing to God. So you can be rich and give generously. You can be poor and give generously, sacrificially. And God is pleased with the rich giving generously and the poor giving sacrificially as, as well, because it's an indication of the heart. The wallet. Let's talk about your wallet. I have a wallet. You have a wallet. You have a bank account. This wallet is very powerful because it is an indicator of my heart. What is inside and what I do with it. How I s spend the money, where I spend the money, when I spend the money, with who I spend the money, and my attitude toward money, and my attitude toward giving. This is an indication of my spiritual well-being or my spiritual carelessness. When we move into spiritual carelessness, this will show. This will show. I'm stopping to give my tithes. I don't have enough money. I'm too poor to give. I, we hear that in the Philippines. We ask sometimes some of the pastors, are your people uh, giving tithes? Oh, no, pastor, they are way too poor to give. No, we don't dare to ask them. No, that's not, that's not, that's not right. Everybody can give because it's not the amount, it's the heart. And this wallet is an indicator. That's why, I guess, you rob God. So it's not about the amount that you rob God. It's about why, how you give to God. Why, when did we ever rob? When did we ever cheat God? It's, it's in your heart. It's in, you, it's in your heart. The people didn't understand that their actions were a direct result of the attitude, of their attitude toward God. And that their attitude was sinful. Amen? And I did not put in this text because of time and everything, but if you look a bit further, God says, bring all the tithes to the house, that there will be food in my house. And prove me, or test me, find out. I remember when I started as a Christian, I needed to experience that. I was told about paying tithes, but I, I never heard that before. You know, because I come from a Catholic background. So Catholic background, we are not paying really a lot of tithes. We don't like to spend money for nothing. And for nothing, because it's only for God, so it's for nothing, you know. So I remember at the time I was in Bible school, we had three children, and sometimes because I was not full, fully employed, full-time employed, I had very little money. Sometimes 25 cents, two dollars. I remember being at, at church on Sunday night, having two dollars, and that would be my two dollars for the coming week. And the offering would come, says, believe the Lord, give to the Lord, and see how the Lord will bless you. So, but I only have two dollars, and this is, this is what I have for the week. And I learned to trust and let that two dollar go into the basket.
And how many times after the service I would get the $20 and shake. I would get bags of clothes, bag of foods, people coming to the door. Because we were, we were poor. We were really poor with three young children. And these were tough times. But how many times we have seen the hand of God over and over again. And these are the, 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 the it, this is from the heart. You need to learn that on your own. You, you need to test. That's why God says, prove me. Test me and see how God will, 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 will do. And verse 11, he says, I, and I don't want to make a teaching on, on tithes on, on this morning. That's not the point. I want to talk about the heart. This very important principle in verse 11. I will rebuke the devourer. Wow. What happened when I decide not to give to God? It's not about the money. It's about the heart. I don't trust, I don't want, I don't believe, I want to keep it for myself. Uh, I have other more important things in my life than, you know, giving my money to the church. The devourer comes. You may work 75 hours a week. You may spend the night over your computer trying to finish the project. You will not gain more. You can kill yourself at the job. The devourer will destroy the crop. The devourer will come because when you don't obey the financial law of the Lord, you are giving access to the devourer to, okay, yeah, I have access to them. I can, yeah, mess them up co correctly. But the Lord says, bring this money to the house of the Lord, prove me, and I will rebuke the devourer. He shall not destroy wow, I'm gaining and obeying the laws of God instead of having the devourer to, I work hard, I earn more money, but the devourer takes it. It's wasted at the end because for many reasons, it's question of heart. If I don't trust the love of God and I move into spiritual carelessness, I will spend my money wrongly. I will invest it thinking that it will be a, a, a big profit. I will be losing on that one. I will buy things that I don't need. I will, you know, my, my, my whole area of my life is corrupt by spiritual care carelessness. And the way that I would, thinking about money, using money, will also be reflected in that. So much better obey the Lord, trust the Lord, and let them rebuke the devourer. So what the little that you earn, the little that you have will remain to use. Let me give you a testimony. Remember years, years ago, I had four children at that time, and I worked for a farmer. I was the right, right arm of this farmer that we have become very close friends through the years. We live in the basement of the house. I earn minimum wage. I had four children. And my wife was babysitting for their children and our children because the man and the woman were going to sell the vegetable to the market in Montreal, the big city, and they had to leave during the night. I was a father living with minimum wage. I should be poor. I was rich because God blessed me with other ways. My wife was working babysitting, so it provided the food. We had free rent, didn't need to spend uh, money on the gas. And during this time when I was living in this house, in this condition, I was paying my tithes and I bought two guitars because I was uh, having a guitar. I had money to buy things. I uh, even started a small investment of money at that time for the schooling of my children. I had friends who were single, who earned big salaries. They were always broken. Uh, broken, broke. They were <laughs> broken and broke, and they, they, they were indebted. I never had debt. And I'm free. God is blessing, sometimes not with the amount of money that you earn, but with the, the togetherness of how he, he, he provides to your life and generosity. And if you remember the, the teaching of uh, Larry Burkett on finance, what is wealth? The well that God produced into your life that you will never be repenting of. Wealth is not only money in your pocket. 
It's a good husband. It's the joy of being in your family under a roof, enjoying a life, a vacation once in a while, a little blessing here, a little blessing there. It's the, the coming together of every little details of your life under God's governance where God says, you honor me, I honor you. Amen? That's the wealth that God is providing. Amen? In closing, the most destructive manifestation of spiritual indifference where they ended up being Malachi chapter 3 verse 13 to 15 your words have been hard against me oh before they had words that worried him now they go further that's what I'm saying it starts with not recognizing the love of the Lord spiritual care it gets worse it gets worse and it gets worse you see how have we spoken against you you have said it is vain to serve the Lord. It's not worthy. I've been there. I've been a Christian long enough. I've been involved in the church. I've been doing this. I've been on the mission field. I've been doing a lot of things. It's, it's not worthy. Your words against me. And the word used in the Bible is strong, hard, bold, and resolute. At this stage of their spiritual relationship with God, they are pretty much determined. They are not going to give attention to God anymore. They are not going to get involved anymore. They are not going to pay much attention to the Lord. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. They have been disappointed. And it's easy to be disappointed as Christian in the church. People disappoint us. Uh, pastors disappoint us. Uh, uh, working in the church is tiring. And we, we, get, we get tired at, at times. You know, one time, the Lord made me listen to my words. Have you listened to your words? Many times we don't realize that. We speak a lot, first of all. Eh? We're all big speakers here. Um, but do you listen to your words about God, your conversations with your friends, uh, the, the edification, the salt that should come out of your mouth, or the unwholesome talks, the vain words, or whatever it is that's wrong? You need to stop and think sometimes, What's coming out of my mouth? What, what am I really saying about God, about life, about values, about faith, about something, about sacrifice? Or what, what, what am I encouraging in other people's life? Remember one time when I was confronted by a pastor to consider moving from Canada to Hong Kong to be a full-time missionary. You know what I was saying? Are you crazy? Me? Never. It's not possible. I have four children. I don't have money. I don't have this. I cannot. I cannot for this reason. And then my list of excuses that I, I could not move. I could do some short-term mission going here and there, but I could not move with a family of, of four children into another land. And then suddenly, I'm not exaggerating. It happened just like that. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. Have you listened to what you just spoke. What you just spoke out of your mouth is your faith in me. And everything that had come out of my mouth was cannot, not possible, me, no, not possible for this, not possible for that, not possible, not possible. And then I repented because my words were not the words of God coming out of my mouth. Have you listened to your own words? When we, when we ask ourselves, what's the use of serving God? That's a very poor indicator you know, of, of what, what you have become in Christ. In the church, there are many ways to view service. And I want to finish with the next text. This is the most beautiful and wonderful text and encouraging text for all of us this morning. Then you will find another group of people regardless of the influence of what's in the society people are not serving God right people are not of good influence you and me can be in that group here there's another group a fellowship those who fear the Lord spoke with one another 
So it's not one person, but it's a group. And if you want to be victorious in Christ, you better be part of a good fellowship. You better be, be sure that you select friends that are also fearing the Lord. Friends that will build you up and lift you up to the Lord and pray for one another. This is a fellowship. If you want to look at some uh, qualities of this group described here, they fear the Lord. They love the Lord. They are concerned for the Lord. They respect the Lord and they obey the Lord. They spoke to one another. It shows the importance of fellowship. People like-minded people. You know, there are a lot of people around us. There's a lot of values among Christianity. There's a lot of standards in Christianity. Get with the right one. They, it says in our text here, they esteemed his name. But actually, this is a very interesting word, the word esteem here. It's the word weaving. You know, when you weave, you work, and you, you weave. Yeah, you are. Yeah. I don't know how to weave, but, you know, I know that some of you know. It means that some Bible translations have used it to uh, meditate, they thought, they are thinking about his name, they are meditating about his name, they are valuing his name, they are weaving about the name. That means that they are working some, something, they find something, they study, they think how to honor his name, they think about it, they are concerned about it, it becomes their goal to come to a greater understanding of God. They serve God from their heart in contrast to those serving God. Before they are serving God, but we have seen not with their heart. But here they say they are serving God. That means they are serving God in the right way, in a way that is pleasing to the Lord, in a contrast. And what I like here, when this group and fellowship talk to one another about God, about faith, about their service to God, God is listening. God knows you and He knows how much you love Him and how much you are faithful to Him. If nobody pats you on the shoulder, don't worry. God, God, God is good enough to pat you on the shoulder at the right time. And here it says, the Lord paid attention, but in King James says, arken. But it means prick the ears. An example, children are playing outside in the yard. Auntie so-and-so Mary comes with a bag of candies. And she says, candies, Oop! the children were all playing, not paying attention, but as soon they heard the word candy, wow, <laughs> they prick their ears and they run to Auntie Mary to get the candies. That is what God does. As soon as God sees the uh, heart that reveres him and a fellowship of people who love him and they are dedicated to him, he pricks the ears. Ah, I pay attention and he takes his little notebook, uh, little or big, I don't know, it must be a big one because he's writing a book of remembrance and your name is written in that book. And that is where you and I, we need to do that be. And this is w why we have church. It is so that, w why, do we, why is it necessary to have a conversation with God like this so that God can talk the truth? about us so that if we are in the first group we can awake and says how did we do it how did we profane his name how did we not honor the lord how did we rob the lord how were we careless and the lord is telling us you want to know the lord will tell you everything so that you can move from this group into this group where your name it will be sure to be written in the book of remembrance. And on that day, oh, I love this part. This is always something that's so dear to me. You shall see the distinction between those who do not serve God and those who serve the Lord. Those who do not, you know, uh, respect the Lord and those who really live for the Lord. You will see there is a difference. It's worth it. Never come down to a point where like they, it says, it's not worth serving the Lord. It's too hard. It's a burden. What, where, how worrisome it is. It's not worth it. Wow! I want to serve the Lord. 
I want to serve the Lord because I believe that there is a, a book of remembrance. My name is written there. And I want to hear it. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and rejoice with me for eternity. That is the goal. That's why this conversation that Malachi is offering to us this morning is so important. It's a message of preparation for that great day when Messiah will open this book and read your name. So it's not only the name written in the book of the Lamb that is salvation. It's also the name written in the book of service, the book of sacrifice, the book of commitment, the book of your life living sacrifice. That's the book. Of, this, is, this is a different book. God has many books. There's a books. There's, there, there are books about your life and everything is written in it. And revelation. There's the, the, the Lamb book of life. And there's the remembrance book. And this one is for your service, your love unto the Lord, the joy of walking with Jesus. And this is the conversation that God wants to have with you this morning, inviting you. Don't mess up your life. Don't waste anything. Give your best to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand. Praise God. Hallelujah. Time is already too late to sing a song, so we will just close in, in prayer. Father God, thank you for this conversation. Thank you, God, that you are a truthful friend. You don't speak only to make us have some good little feelings, make us feel good, but you speak to us in the deepest part of our life, helping us to, to not to be blind to our own sinfulness, wrong attitudes, so that we will continue on declining. But Lord, you come to us in truth to reveal to us what we are really. Help us. Find, give us ways, Lord, to, to analyze our life and to respond to it. You are inviting us, return to me, that I will return to you, so that my name and the name of my brothers and my sisters here will be sure to be written in this book of remembrance. The book that has the name of those who love you, those who fear you, those who serve you with all of their hearts. Thank you, Lord. You are inviting us. You are speaking into our lives and you are bringing the Holy Spirit to convict us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, help us to have more of this conversation with you and our personal devotions every day as we read your word, as we pray that we will be quiet enough and sensitive enough and open enough and pure enough to hear your words come to the deepest part of our hearts. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen.